All right, welcome back, YouTubers. This is In the Northwest Native News. I'm your host, Jeff Ferguson. And I'm your co-host, Margo Hill. All right, and what a weekend. We are happy to be here. <laughs> We're springing forward, and uh, it, it's a great day to be indigenous. <laughs> and kind of a case of the Mondays or, <laughs> or something. Clearly, we had some technical difficulties this morning. They only put us about a minute behind, so... We thank you once again for joining us. Uh, we're here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. covering news and events that uh, directly affect the uh, tribes of the in, the in the Northwest, as far west as the Colvilles, back east to the Blackfeet, down south to the Umatillas and Warm Springs, and up north to the Kootenays and Kalispells with the Colvilles, Coeur d'Alene's, Spokane's, Yakima's, Nimipu, and pretty much everybody in between. So we are here three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 8.30. We'd like to invite you to, to uh, join us. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, plug them in the feed here. We'll be monitoring the feed uh, for each and every one of our live feeds. And then uh, we'll also be leaving the links to all of the stories that we cover here uh, in the comment section below. So... Uh, that being said, we have... Um, and we're going to have a geo Indian geography test of the, all the tribes at the end. Oh, I'm okay. Joking. <laughs> this Jeff, week, I didn't hear... <laughs> Jeff uh, gets them listed out, and I'm like, I couldn't do that. Oh, right. Well, I just think ge ge geographically, we go west to the Colvilles, down south <laughs> to the Umatilla and Warm Springs, then kind of Nimipu, but we kind of skip the Yakimas in there. But then we come up over here to the Blackfeet, and then the Coeur d'Alene's. Well, Coeur d'Alene's, then Blackfeet, then up to the uh, Kootenai and Kalispell, and then bring it around to the Spokane's and the Coeur d'Alene's, and that kind of covers them all. Yeah, Salish so, Kootenai. Salish Kootenai, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, and uh, every now and, now and then we'll throw in a Kutuknuk from uh, <laughs> BC, because those guys don't get a lot of uh, airtime either. So, But, you know, the First Nations of Canada, they get all sorts of funding for their their media stuff so yeah but it's fun to cover them anyhow and Sinaik's band we're gonna have to get a update on the Sinaik's band because those guys have been going to court and uh, trying to pull out of extinction I guess I don't know how <laughs> you put it they were they were declared extinct by the crown in Canada uh, a while back and now they're in court saying uh, yeah we're kind of still here and uh, so yeah we'll have to get an update from those guys anyhow we have some good stories today. Uh, if you want to hit the big co down the corner, this one's really cool. We found this. Uh, this is uh, this. It's called This Week uh, at the Interior, and this uh, is coming directly out of the Department of Interior's office. And it's a pretty cool little deal. We'll play it. You can find this on YouTube. So go ahead and play that one. Oh, All right there hit the road this week for the first time as secretary, making stops in New Mexico and Utah. In Albuquerque, she held a listening session with the All Pueblo Council of Governors at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. She spoke about President Biden's American Jobs Plan, which would support a number of interior initiatives, including funding for tribal and rural communities to expand broadband coverage, as well as improving roads, bridges, water systems, and spurring economic development. Then it was off to Utah, where the secretary took part in discussions on Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments, meeting with tribes, federal, state, and local leaders and other stakeholders. Interior is leading a review of the boundaries and management conditions of the two national monuments pursuant to the president's executive order. Both trips were done under strict COVID-19 guidelines to keep everyone safe. Interior will invest $1.6 billion this year to take on critical deferred maintenance projects and improve transportation and recreation infrastructure in national parks, national wildlife refuges and recreation areas, and the Bureau of Indian Education Schools. The funding was made possible by the newly created National Parks and Public Land Legacy Restoration Fund, established in 2020 by the Great American Outdoors Act. Secretary Holland this week announced the formation of a new missing and murdered unit within the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services. The MMU will provide leadership and direction for cross-departmental and interagency work involving missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives. The secretary said violence against indigenous peoples is a crisis that has been underfunded for decades. 
The Bureau of Reclamation has released final technical details supporting the 2021 Secure Water Act report. Reclamation's 2021 Westwide Climate and Hydrology Assessment plus seven individual basin reports provide detailed information on climate change impacts and adaptation strategies to increase water supply reliability in the West. After a five-year review, the Fish and Wildlife Service is recommending no change to the status of the grizzly bear in the lower 48 states as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. This recommendation follows a thorough review of the best available science informed by an independently peer-reviewed species status assessment. This week of April 5th through the 12th is International Dark Sky Week, and the National Park Service is collaborating with the Illuminating Engineering Society to improve outdoor lighting in national parks without affecting night sky viewing, the fastest growing park visitor activity. Together, they'll develop lighting standards and best practices for parks and other protected areas to help plan night sky friendly lighting in future construction projects and parks of the national park system and our social media picture of the week where you can almost catch the scent of these wildflowers in bloom at 8,000 feet on BLM managed land just south of Monitor Pass in California, Sierra Nevada. The picturesque range stretches for some 400 miles in Eastern California and translates literally as snowy mountains. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. That's this week at Interior. Sorry, that's what I was trying to show you. Now. Okay, so a, a lot of the um, uh, craft and uh, seamstress uh, sewer folks uh, are at the fairs, at the crafts fairs, when you go out to Northern Quest and you kind of build a relationship with them. So I know uh, Devonica Brown Eagle mm -hmm. is a beautiful seamstress. There's a lot uh, on Facebook. Um, it just depends on who's taking orders. Uh, you know, sometimes Marceline Madeira uh, is taking orders, yeah. and it just depends on who's available. And you can uh, you can check out the Inchlim uh, Craft and Beadwork uh, group on Facebook, and also Spokane Indians. I think Spokane Indian Beadwork is another one that you can check out. There's uh, several groups that have people that are selling that kind of stuff on Facebook, not necessarily in marketplace, but in uh, on Facebook as groups. So to be sure to check that out, and you can check with also uh, individual uh, artisans too. And then we'll have be having craft fairs coming up periodically. At uh, I think Northern Quest has another one coming up. The Spokane Tribe Casino has one coming up. I'm sure Coeur d'Alene's will have some vendors out there. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, check those out. So we better keep moving. We're already 11 minutes in, and we have a really cool story here that is about a local, a local gal. 
see if I can pull this one off. Yeah, so Sophia Turning Robe was selected as the Act 6 Scholar. So we're real excited. Um, she received the news that she is going to be uh, receiving a scholarship, uh, a full-ride scholarship to attend Whitworth University as part of that Act 6 Scholar program. Um, you know, Turning Robe said that she wants to broaden her, her horizons and learn how to give back to the tribal community. Um, it was exciting. They notified her on Zoom. Uh, Sophia Turning Robe is an enrolled member of the Spokane Tribe as well as the Siksika First Nation in, in Canada. She'll be studying political science. She is also an athlete. Uh, Jeff, she, she's going to be playing volleyball for the Whitworth Pirates. Uh, you, you, I think you went to Whitworth, mm -hmm. and uh, it's exciting. Her mom, uh, Marina Turning Robe, went to Whitworth. Uh, and uh, Sophia just has such a bright future. She's a beautiful jingle dress dancer. Um, and her mom, you know, was always working on her uh, regalia and her make her new outfits. Uh, but she's just a beautiful young gal, and we're real excited for her. Yeah, congratulations, Sophie. We'll uh, watch for you on the volleyball court. Yeah, yeah cool. and at the link, you can check out actually some of her beautiful dancing. Uh, Jeff did some recording uh, of, I think it was the Spokane Tribal powwow. Um, and uh, you can see some of the jingle dress dancers there. Uh, but she's, you know, has an amazing bright future. And, you know, it just goes to show when our, our young Native people are working hard, you know, they're disciplined in their athletics, they're disciplined in their academics, uh, they're, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah. So, yeah. very cool. We'll have to keep an eye on her. So, moving right along, we have a story uh, on the Warm Springs Res. So, this is ongoing. The Warm Springs Reservation water crisis is uh, reminiscent of Flint, Michigan. This article comes to us out of Native News Online. It's about the water crisis. The residents of the reservation have had to live with uh, contaminated water for almost five years, and the federal and state government has only provided Band-Aid type fixes to one, uh, according to one tribal official down there. So the Warm Springs water crisis, um, according to this article, the, the author goes on to say that it reminded him of a long-lasting water crisis in Flint, Michigan. In March 2016, he was on, uh, uh, it says, uh, let's see, yeah. Matthew, no, that's not, that's not Matthew. We lost him. I lost him. Uh, Levi, here we go, right Levi. Here. Levi goes on to say that, as it turns out, I was due to arrive in Flint. Oh, no, we're a little, okay. The Warm Spring, in March 2016, I was on my way to Flint to cover the Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders presidential debate when I got a text that a group of Flint community leaders invited media members to a press conference on the local water crisis that was drawing national attention because of its lead contamination, uh, drinking water, uh, contaminated drinking water system. Access to water is a basic human right that the average American takes for granted uh, as, they as they turn on their faucet to get a drink. Yet what comes out of the tap in Flint was not safe to drink. And so this article goes on uh, and talks about how the water crisis in Warm Springs compares to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. And so um, he goes into detail. Uh, again, we'll leave the link in here. Some of the things that he says, while the Flint water crisis impacted more people on a proportional basis, the Warm Springs crisis has, it, uh, has at times negatively impacted two-thirds of the 3,300 residents living on, the, on Oregon's largest reservation. Some sections of the 1,000 square mile reservation have been on a boil notice on and off since last January, but pipes have been failing in the community since 2017, according to the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Emergency Manager Dan Martinez. Tribal, tribal citizens say they have not been able to take showers or properly bathe because the contaminated water irritates their skin. Residents have been uh, not been able to use tap water to cook because of the foul smell and unpleasant taste. The Treaty of 1855 between the Warm Springs Tribe and the United States says the federal gov government or the Bureau of Indian Affairs has a trust responsibility to, to provide Warm Springs with access to clean water. I don't want to put blame on the BIA, but the fact remains that a lot of it is the infrastructure that's failing as a result of, of an aging system, Martinez told Native News Online reporter in March. It's never been updated. You got metal pipes that are going into copper pipes that are going into plastic pipes. When you combine all three, all of these materials in, into an aging system, something's bound to give. We only put band-aids on the system and then it fails and it fails. Um, 
so yeah, the last last year, the lack of clean water uh, is bad at any time, but has been exacerbated since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic when hand washing and sanitizing became essential to staying safe from the virus. The tribe has lost 22 citizens since last March. Wow. Um, last month, President Biden introduced a $2.2 trillion infrastructure package that aims to fix any or to, main, uh, to fix many of the infrastructure problems across the country. During his remarks, he mentioned uh, tribes 14 times. So that money is, is clearly going to be hitting Indian country. And, and Jeff, actually, you took a trip down to Warm Springs. Mm -hmm. you've, you've talked to Dan Martinez and, uh, you know, local tribes, and you gathered some donations. We made some phone calls, and you brought water down there. But again, that's kind of a temporary solution. That was a couple years ago, and they had boil notices back then, and we brought 20,000 Twenty thousand bottles of water down there for them. Yeah, the Spokane um, tribe, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, the Kalispell tribe yeah. all pitched in, and we brought you guys brought down AT &I. pallets of water. AT and I pallets of water. Yeah, down to Warm Springs. And you talked to Dan Martinez. Yeah, yeah, and he, it was just for me. It was really interesting. There was a lot of kind of smaller problems that they were dealing with too. But to have this going, you know, ongoing, I couldn't imagine living in an area for for years and years and years where the water problem has not been fixed or addressed. And clearly, you know, they, they don't want to point fingers at the BIA, but it is a trust responsibility and they have a treaty from 1855. Uh, hopefully uh, some of this uh, money that Biden's, uh, the $2.2 .2 trillion infrastructure stuff will help help with that. You know, that's far too long, you know. Um, as it mentions, we do take that for granted. But uh, it's something that, there's something that can be fixed there. and. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, maybe take a trip back down there. Yeah, don't yeah. take water for granite. For granite. <laughs> Native Americans pull tribes, uh, pull, tribes pull ahead in COVID-19 vaccinations. This is uh, pretty exciting news here. So I think you got that one pulled up. Hey there, we're Brooke Linen. We're working from our homes to make the most comfortable things for yours. Oh. Like sheets, towels, and loungewear. All with free delivery to your door oh. and backed by hundreds okay. of thousands of comfortable customers. Visit brooklinen.com to well, get 10% off your first okay. order. Theoretically. Oh. Looks like it's loading now. Hmm. Well. Hmm. So, well, wait, we can go on. If this pops up, it pops up. We can go back to it. Okay. Um, we'll go right here. We'll go back to it if it, if it comes up. Okay. Anyhow, uh, high inoculation rates stem from centralization, or centralized healthcare systems and culture that strives to protect elders. This by Robbie Whelan is the last name, and this one's in the Wall Street Journal. So uh, when Vanessa Begay heard in late January that clinics on the Indian Reservation uh, where she lives in Arizona were offering COVID-19 vaccinations to all adults, she rushed to get in line for her shot. The 24-year-old is a college student, mother of two, and a member of the Navajo Nation. Her grandfather, a diabetic in his 60s, died in July after he con contracted the coronavirus, coronavirus and was put on a respirator. Pretty much the whole Navajo Nation wanted to get the vaccine as soon as it came out, Ms. Begay said. We all felt it was the right thing to do to protect our families, especially our elders. Almost everyone I know has lost someone, and we all just want the pandemic to be over. In Apache country, Arizona, where uh, Ms. Begay lives, about two-thirds uh, which about two thirds of which is covered by the Navajo, Fort Apache, and Zuni Indian reservations. 42% of the population is fully vaccinated, according to the CDC and prevention data. Uh, in Glacier County, Montana, home of the Blackfeet Nation, 46.7% of the population is vaccinated. In Blaine County, Montana, where one third of the population lives on Fort Belknap, uh, reservation. It's 45.9. Overall, 34.5% of the U.S. population has received at least one vaccine shot, according to the CDC. So when 34.5% when uh, of the, the overall population has had their first shot, 42% uh, uh, in, down in Arizona has received their full vaccination on the reservation of 46.7% 46 in uh, Blackfeet Nation. 
That's high. That's really high. I don't know what the, the Spokane or the Colvilles or Coeur d'Alene's or any of these guys around here are, but that'd be interesting to find out. I'm sure they're right up there. The Spokane's have had amazing, uh, you know, just streamline. You know, shout out to Marcus and all those guys out there that have been re working really hard to get everybody vaccinated. But what they're doing is working. And mm -hmm. so that's what this this video that it might have been pulled. I don't know. It looks yeah. like it might have been, been pulled. But uh, we were hoping to share that with you. So anyhow, um, it's numbers are up for vaccinations in Indian country, and it's a good thing to see our our uh, IHS, our clinics uh, stepping up and, and getting the job done. Uh, good job. Shout out to all the healthcare workers in Indian country. So. Okay, we have a couple of uh, murdered, missing Indigenous women announcements. Uh, first, we have Beth Carey. Um, she's been missing uh, since uh, April 8th, oh. uh, missing from Issaquah. Um, I can close that. There, from Issaquah, Washington, a 32 year old, uh, 5'6, 125 pounds with light brown hair and brown eyes. Uh, she left home wearing the blue jacket uh, pictured. Um, she is uh, she may be suicidal and considered at risk she talked about going around um, uh, some natural areas that may have cliffs or steep ledges but please call the Issaquah Police Department at 425-837-3200 if you know her whereabouts so that again that's Beth Carey we also have another one out of Blackfeet Nation and this is uh, Dalen Wagner Dalen Wagner. Age 15, uh, weight 200 pounds, height 5'3". Her eyes are brown, hair is red. Um, if you know anything about the whereabouts of Dalen, please contact Blackfeet Law Enforcement at 406-338-4000. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, definitely try to keep an eye out for, for those gals. And, you know, if you see anything, say something. If you see something, say something. They keep saying that over and over again. And I think we really need to hold true. We'd rather be safe than sorry. It's been such a problem. Um, there is getting more attention to that problem, but still, you know, we'd be rather be safe than sorry, man. Uh, unfortunately, it's still something that's that's uh, out of control. So um, that being said, I have a uh, call to indigenous artists here. This one, I don't know. Did you get that one? I didn't get that you one. You get that one? Okay, so this is a call to indigenous artists, indigenous women, expression of resilience. So this one is coming up here pretty quick. I'll see if I can get a better view of this to read for you. 412. All right, and it says, call to indigenous women artists, poets and craftspeople, expressions of resilience, art, poetry, and traditional crafts by indigenous women. This show celebrates the creativity and resilience of indigenous women and is intended to shine, a shine a spotlight on their words and creations. The show will include contemporary works of art, traditional craft, traditional craft, and be uh, inter, interspersed with poetry, music, and other art forms. The show will be run from May 8th to June 26th at the Big Fork Art and Cultural Center in Big Fork, Montana. For more information, you can contact Laura Hodge, the executive director at Big Fork and Cultural Center. That's Laura at back. That's B A C C Big Fork dot org, or call 406-837-6927, or you can visit them at the Big Fork uh, the Big Fork uh, website at Big Fork Art and Cultural Center. So that's coming up and. For indigenous women, thought we'd throw that one in there. I know I didn't have the best of graphics for that. Uh, we got somebody here, C U J Carey, watching live from Mission, Oregon, on the Umatilla Res. All right, we got some Umatillas chiming in. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. We love to cover the Umatillas. Yeah, you guys are rocking it down there. Yeah, you know it's nice to hear when we get people from from down south because that was a big part. You know, I know they have a lot of cool things happening down there and we want to be sure to send us if you guys have any flyers that you want us to run or, or talk about let us know we'll be happy to read them thank you for for chiming in um our last story this one is on a uh bill that passes so oh. so all schools are required to teach native american history in north dakota great story this is out of bismarck north dakota by darren thompson uh, a bill will require all North Dakota schools to teach Native American history, culture, and treaty rights uh, passed through the N North Dakota State Senate. 
Um, this bill calls for requiring all elementary and secondary public and non-public schools in the state to include curriculum on Native American history. We are pleased and gratified uh, that my colleagues in North Dakota uh, have passed state, uh, Senate Bill 2304. Um, it's long been needed, uh, said North Dakota State Representative Ruth, Ruth Buffalo. All right, Ruth. Um, I was on a panel with Ruth uh, back in D.C. This is exciting. So Native people of North Dakota are a crucial part of the cultural and educational landscape in our state, um, and this bill will ensure movement towards mutual understanding and cooperation for future uh, future generations. So this is real exciting um, to see uh, that there's going to be education uh, provided about uh, the first peoples. You know, often in our grade schools, we hear, hear all about Columbus and the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria, but we don't hear about the indigenous people. Wow, that's, and to have this happen in North Dakota really says something, that's exciting. You know, North Dakota has historically had a lot of controversy between uh, the indigenous population and the non-natives that in the area and so to have this come through that's exciting you know I think once we and that's really a lot of what a lo lot of things are about when we look at trying to get things done in Indian country to help uh, Indian people um, we get a lot more cooperation from people that are educated and they understand the history and uh, the trauma and you know all the different things that that we've had to be uh resilient through you know so it's exciting north dakota is a yeah that's really cool and, and what's really cool here is that the the bill's prime sponsor is um a minority leader joan heckman and heckman is actually an enrolled member of the turtle mountain band of chippewa from belcourt north dakota and then of course uh co-sponsor senator marcellus uh, you know, the, this work is by natives, um, uh, representation matters. Yeah. You know, we have seen the surge of Native Americans that are get, running for political office. They are winning um, and they are representing us all up the, you know, and across the states. Yeah, a lot of it goes back to vote. Get out and vote. Get these allies into office so we can get these bills passed because we can't do it without them. The, right. the, uh, the battle is too high. We just, it's... It's that it's an uphill battle that is way too high. So anyhow, we are about out of time, and uh, we just want to thank you once again for chiming in. We're here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 8:30 p.m. Um, I, I, it's all I have. What about you? A couple birthday shout-outs. It, it was Jasmine Stern's birthday the other day, and she's also uh, celebrating sobriety, being uh, years of uh, being clean and sober. So shout out to Jasmine Stearns. Also, Carrie Pocotis um, out of Nespelum, Washington. Big shout out to Carrie Pocotis. And then lastly, uh, Gerald Ford Jr., one of my little cousins up on the Kalispell Res. Uh, uh, happy birthday to Smiley. All right. All right. Happy birthday, Smiley. All right. <laughs> we'll see you on, when on Wednesday. Yeah.